Well, uh, again, I fall into the habit of lying to you because two weeks ago I said, Next week, we will be in Ruth chapter 1, uh, forgetting that I was gone last week. Okay, so I apologize for that. Uh, I do want to say thank you for your prayers as uh, I was holding a gospel meeting in Tullahoma. I appreciate that. I think it went uh, rather well. And I also appreciate Dad filling in for me. I know that every time he does that, he does a great job. And I'm certainly thankful to have him to call on. And so tonight, we are going to be in Ruth chapter 1, but we want to begin by reminding ourselves some things about Ruth that we need to keep in the forefront of our mind as we begin reading. And so we want to begin with our theme verse and our theme phrase. Our theme verse is chapter 1 and verse 16, which we will be reading today, Lord willing. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Okay, now that's going to be a very bold statement for Ruth to make, and we'll talk about why when we get there here in just a little bit. And also, remember, I said this, I think, when we first introduced this, this verse. Uh, a lot of times I get people who ask me to read this at weddings, and uh, I want you to remember that because it's going to sound... A little strange when we finally read it in context. Our uh, theme phrase is three simple words, two saving relationships. And we're going to look at the relationship today that is a saving relationship between Ruth and Naomi, and ultimately we'll look at the kinsman redeemer, that of Boaz and Ruth. Let's break down uh, chapter one here. There we go. Chapter one, Again, here's the outline for the whole book, but we're only going to focus on chapter 1 today. Uh, we have the introduction in verses 1 through 5. Really what this is, in, verse, in the first five verses, it's setting the stage for everything else that you're going to see throughout chapter 1, ultimately until Ruth meets Boaz. And then you have what I call the Exodus, their journey from Bethlehem to uh, Moab, and then you have the return um, to Bethlehem in verse 19 through 20 through 22, and that is where we end our chapter 1. And so, the book of Ruth is very different from other books of our Bible in how we learn from it. Okay, let me explain. In narrative, you expect to read about the movers and the shakers, right? You expect to read about, and they did this, and they went here, and they said these things or whatever. For example, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, next time you're doing a study of the Gospel of Mark, go through and underline or highlight how many times Mark says the word immediately. Okay, that's his favorite word. I think, it's the, I think it's the word that's used most often throughout the Gospel of Mark. And immediately Jesus went here, and immediately Jesus said this. Well, that's what we expect when we see a narrative, that something immediately happened. When we look at the book of Esther, which we studied before Ruth, that's kind of what we saw. Esther went here and did this, Mordecai went here and did this, the king went here and did this, uh, Haman went here and did these things. And the speech that we have from Esther, Haman, Mordecai, etc. is uh, very professional speech, almost informative speech. There's very little dialogue going on. Now, if you remember from two weeks ago, I said Ruth is very different because out of 85 verses, 50 of them are direct dialogue. That's a lot. Now, that's a good percentage. 50 verses out of 85 are direct speech. So what are we going to learn or how are we going to learn from this? We're not going to be learning necessarily by the things that people do, but more by the things that people say. And relationships are going to be very important throughout this book. So let's get into it with chapter 1 and the first two verses. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and, his, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Now here, just in the first two verses, we see really everything we need to know about our beginning characters, uh, except obviously Ruth, Orpah, and Boaz. So here we have several main characters who come up, and I call them main characters even though they are only alive for two verses. 
Okay, spoiler alert, they, these, most of these people die. But uh, they are main characters because they are the ones who set the stage for the rest of the book. There would be no need for a kinsman redeemer if the sons were still alive. There would be no need for uh, Naomi to want to change her name tomorrow, later on in chapter one, if her husband was still alive. And so you have a lot of information here that needs to be looked at. In verse one, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. Uh, The word there in Hebrew is actually the same word twice. One is a noun, one is a verb. It's when the judges judge. That's why in our English Bibles, uh, we put the book of Ruth after the book of Judges because it's the same time frame. In a Hebrew Bible, it would be very different. In the Hebrew Bible, the, the Old Testament, or their Bible, as they would call it, is broken up into three sections, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And Ruth comes after, uh, in, in the section of the writings. Okay, So this is why we put Ruth in, uh, uh, close to Judges, because it's in the time when the judges judged. Uh, your Bible may say when the judges ruled or something like that, that's fine. There was a famine in the land. If you ever want to know about a book of the Old Testament, go on YouTube and type in that particular book and then type rabbinical commentary and hit enter and just see what you get. Now here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that they are right about everything. What I am saying is, if there's anyone who is really going to know the history and uh, I don't know what else, just how the flow of the story throughout all the Old Testament, it would be a Jewish rabbi because that is their Bible. That is what they study. Okay, So I'm not saying agree, but I am saying it's worth listening to. The Jewish rabbis say that this famine, because this is during the time when the judges judged, is a natural phenomenon brought on by supernatural means. In other words, God brought the famine because the people during the time of the judges did what was right in their own eyes. They were exceedingly evil, and that's the prompt of this famine. Now, here's the problem with that. There is absolutely no textual evidence to support that claim. Now, if you want to believe that, I can't tell you that it's wrong, but I also can't tell you that it's right. Okay, but that's what they say, and that also is going to shape their view of why uh, Elimelech, Malon, and Kilian die. Okay, so they went to sojourn in the country of Moab. I think that's an interesting word to use to sojourn, because to sojourn means to be a residential alien. Okay, and so they're not going to Moab necessarily to set up shop. I think they always had intentions of coming back to Bethlehem. And I know a lot of times because when we read this, we, we read it saying, oh, well, you know, the boys are going to get married and they're going to set up their own lives and they're marrying Moabites and so they must have left everything in Bethlehem. No, I think they always had an intention of returning. So they're sojourning in the country of Moab. Now, just show of hands, please. How many of your Bibles say country of Moab? Just a few. How many say fields of Moab? Really? How many says plains of Moab? Hmm, okay. How many just says Moab? I don't know. All right, cool. Um, the, the, the word for country that is translated up here, this is the ESV on the screen. And the, the word for country could be field, it could be countryside, it could be, it could be country, it could be nation. It just depends. Now, um, a lot of times Hebrew scholars will read this and say, oh, well, they went to the fields of Moab with the intention of uh, being involved in agriculture and making the way for themselves and uh, doing things like that. I think that's reading a little too much into it. I think this means they're just going to be citizens of Moab for a while, going back to the sojourn part. Uh, He, his wife, and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech. The name Elimelech literally means God is my king, or I'm sorry, my God is king, Eli is uh, my God, and and, uh, Melech is uh, king. The name of his wife was Naomi. There are two names in scripture that we have terribly butchered, and this is one of them. It is not the way it's pronounced in Hebrew. It's, I don't know why it's even translated this way. Naomi is not Naomi, it's Noomi, long O, Noomi. Okay. The other name, if anyone's wondering, is Cain, and that's even worse because we spell it C-A-I-N, and in Hebrew it's C-A-Y-A-N, or I-N. It's Cain. Okay. So there's two names if you want to impress your classmates sometime on Sunday morning, tell them they've been pronouncing things wrong. Um, and by the way, Naomi means pleasant. Okay. That's going to be very important when we get to the end of chapter 1. 
The names of his two sons were Milon and Killian. Their names means uh, sickness and wasting. Now, you got to understand something about Hebrew names. Hebrew names are very significant. There was a sermon that I did several years ago called What's in a Name? And we looked at God calling himself literally a verb, the verb to be or I am. Okay, and uh, we call that the Tetragrammaton, the the covenantal name for God. Jewish names or Hebrew names are often made based on uh, the the pun that that it sounds like it makes. Not necessarily that the word itself is a pun. They could be used as as descriptors. They can be used as puns, things like that. Names were loaded back then. Okay, so let's translate that to today. I know several people for example, named Bailey, okay? I like the name Bailey, it's a pretty name. Let's say I know three people named Bailey, all three of them spell their name differently. It's the same exact name, but they all spell it differently. Okay, probably because their mothers think that it would look best monogrammed on a backpack that way, I don't know. But in Hebrew culture, your name meant something. Your name was to be a reminder of something. And so we have to step back and ask the question, why were they named sickness and wasting? Well, probably because as a kid, they were born sick. I mean, that makes perfect sense, right? Now, they're going to live in Moab, spoiler alert again, for 10 years. I don't think the boys ever got over their sickness and wasting. And I think that's ultimately why they wind up dying is because they just get so sick that they can't continue on with life. Okay? So I think they were born sick, stayed that way. You can have your own opinion, that's fine. Uh, they were Ephrathites, Bethlehem and Judah. There are two Bethlehems. Bethlehem and Judah is the one that we're familiar with. It's the one that matters because it's the one that Jesus is born into, the one that David is born into. Uh, and they went to the country of Moab. There we go, and they stayed there. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go on to verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. Uh, These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years. Both Malin and Killian died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Okay, remember, names are important. Uh, Some names more important than others. Since we've talked about names, I'll tell you what Ruth and Naomi means as well. Uh, I'm sorry, Ruth and Orpah. Orpah literally means neck. Now, that sounds like a really weird name to name your daughter. But you can think of it in one of two ways. One way is bad, the other way is good. On the one hand, uh, remember the phrase all throughout the Old Testament, you're a stiff-necked generation. That's talking about a horse or an ox that won't obey the bridle. Okay, so you're, you're a stiff-necked person. Well, Orpah may have just been a hard-to-deal-with child. On the other hand, when you read the Song of Solomon... The neck is considered one of the most beautiful parts of a woman's body. And so she may have been a very beautiful girl. I don't know, but she's got a weird name. Uh, Ruth means friend or companion. And so uh, there, you, there you have it. They were, in, they were there about 10 years. And by the way, I'm talking about taking Moabite wives. A lot of Christians read this and say, well, how dare they? Because as Jews, Jews can have nothing to do with Moabites. Well, Moab is occasionally an enemy of the Jews, but there's nothing explicitly in the law of Moses that forbids marrying of a Hebrew to a Moabite woman. Okay, so they're not breaking the law here. I think that's something that we have uh, construed and, and misrepresented. So they live there about 10 years, the boys die, and so you have Naomi... Uh, was left without her two sons and her husband. Let's stop just for a moment and talk about the severity of what's happened. If you are a woman in ancient Israel and you do not have a man to take care of you, that is significant. Very significant. Women are not looked at favorably in any ancient world. Not the ancient Greeks, not the ancient Romans, not the ancient Hebrews, not the Babylonians, nothing, okay? Women are there for one purpose and one purpose only in ancient context, to bear children. So, Naomi has no way to take care of herself. 
Not only does she have no way to take care of herself, she is in a foreign land with no family. Not only is she in a foreign land with no family, she now has two foreign daughter-in-laws. It seems like she's in a mess. Okay, let's move on to verse 6. She arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with two daughter-in-laws, and they went uh, on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-laws, Go return each of you to, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. All right, a lot to unpack here. Word of food in Israel has reached the fields of Moab. Now, a a critical scholar will look at this and they'll say, well, it obviously couldn't have been written at that time, you know, because they they had no way to spread news that far. Well, y'all, I've heard gossip just as much as y'all have. And I've heard gossip in the hayfield just as much as y'all have too. Okay, so uh, there's, there's no reason why we can't say that she heard this while she was out um, in the fields of Moab doing whatever it was she was doing, maybe harvesting or whatever. And notice that it says that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Remember what we say about Lord when it's in all capital letters. That is the Tetragrammaton, it's the covenant name for God, it's Yahweh. He had visited his people and given them food. And so uh, the rabbis would say that Actually, I I listened to a rabbi talk about the book of Ruth, and this was really interesting. He said that they had to leave because God brought the famine. Because they left, it was kind of like Jonah. They were running from God. So God killed Elimelech, Milan, and Killian. And now because God's killed them, his wrath has been satisfied. He's going to bring food back and let Naomi and the girls come back. And my question is, well, why didn't he just kill them all? uh, I don't know. Uh, She set out from the place where she was with both the daughters-in-laws. They went to the land of Judah. Let's see, verse 8, Naomi said to her daughters-in-laws, Go return to each uh, each of you to her mother's house. Now that's really weird, isn't it? We just spent like three minutes talking about how women weren't valued in any ancient context. So why say return to your mother's house? Well, there's a number of ways to interpret this. I don't know that anyone is better than the other. Uh, return to your mother's house, I think, means return to the women's part of the house. In other words, in ancient context, especially during this time in in a a post-patriarchal period, men and women lived in different tents. And so to return to your mother's house may be, well, just go back to your womanly duties wherever you came from. Okay. Uh, Also, to reference the Song of Solomon again, in the Song of Solomon, the, the beloved and his bride, when they are married, do not go into their father's house. They go into their mother's chamber. Okay, And so she may be referencing here, well, when you go back, go back with the purpose of finding another husband and bearing children and fulfilling your purpose. I think here she's just saying, go home. Go home. And she says, uh, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Now, this begs a a really serious question here. Did these girls know about God? Did they know Yahweh? Now, there's one part of me that says, Well, yeah, they were married, you know, and out of the 10 years that they lived in, In Moab, I don't know how long they were married, but they were probably married long enough to be introduced to God and and, uh, become proselytes, I would say. And then on the other hand, I think, I don't really know how firm their faith is because it seems that Orpah, which we'll get to here in a minute, when she goes back, she goes back to her own gods. Naomi even says, your your, uh, sister-in-law has returned to her own gods. And that bothers me. Okay, you know, I'm not, I wasn't there. I can't go to, up to Naomi and shake her and say, what are you doing? But she does. And Ruth doesn't seem to have a devotion to Yahweh yet when she says, where you go, I will go, and your God will be my God. It's more of a devotion to Naomi than a devotion to Yahweh. Now, I think that's good because that proves to me that I can bring people that I'm close to to the Lord. 
they may come to church just for the sole fact that I asked them to. Okay, so uh, I, I don't really know whether or not they knew about, I think they did know about Yahweh, I just don't know how much. Uh, here's verse 9. The Lord uh, grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her in, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Okay. Go back, find a husband, do your own thing. Notice that where verse 9 says, she kissed them, they lifted up their voices, and they wept. Uh, does anyone's Bible say they wept bitterly? Anybody's? Okay. Um, remember that in ancient Semitic cultures, your emotions were very outwardly expressive. Right, that's why we read about the Jews tearing their clothes and pulling out their hair. Uh, by the way, one passage that I think causes a lot of trouble for people because they just can't understand how a man of God would uh, let some kids get mauled by a bear. Y'all know where I'm going with this? When Elisha calls the she-bears out of the woods to literally maul and kill some young boys. And we could talk about whether they're young boys or not. But they, he does that because these boys are poking fun at him. They say, go up, you you remember the phrase? You bald man. You bald man. Well, Elisha was called a very hairy man earlier in uh, First Kings. And so why would they call him a bald man? Well, what happened right before the she-bears came out? Elijah was taken up into heaven. What do you do when you grieve the loss of one of your dearest friends as a Hebrew person? You pluck the hairs of your beard. You pull the hair out of your head. And so they, were, they weren't making fun of him for being bald. They were making fun of him in his grief. Okay, So all that to say, Hebrew culture is very expressive. And so when we see these ladies, these three ladies, weeping together, they lifted their voices and wept. I don't really pay much attention to and wept. They're wailing. I mean, just absolutely expressive as can be. Uh, and that's really what Jesus says uh, to change, isn't it? When we come to the Sermon on the Mount and we talk about how you give and how you pray and how you fast. Don't do it to be expressive. Do it in secret. Well, everything up until that point had been expressive for people to see. So you see how much of a revolutionary Jesus was. Now notice what they say in verse 10. We will return with you to your people. Who said that? They. It's plural. Both of them said that. So ultimately, at first, both of them are wanting to go back with Naomi. Naomi says, no, it's not going to do you any good. Now, notice this. And we don't get the full humor of this in English, but in Hebrew, it's absolutely hilarious. Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Now, Naomi is an elderly woman. What's she saying here? Not only do I not have a husband, even if I did... I couldn't pop out any babies. And then we're going to find uh, just a little bit later, even if I could, you wouldn't want to wait till they were old enough to marry you. Now, I think a lot of times we read this and we take it so dogmatically literal that we say, oh, Naomi is really being a wise woman here and she's saying, no, it's going to take too much time for me to find a husband and have a baby and let the baby grow up to however old a baby gets before they get married. And No, Naomi is, is using common sense sarcasm. And I love it when sarcasm shows up in the Bible. I think it's hilarious. Okay, verse 12, turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. There you have it. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, uh, to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Okay, notice verse 13. It is exceedingly bitter to me. Now that word bitter is going to be the exact word that Naomi renames herself. Okay, it's the word Mara, right? Uh, for, for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. 
I cringe when people tell me that, that Christians can't get upset with God. That is the biggest pile of baloney I have ever heard. David got upset with God. Naomi got upset with God. Job got upset with God. Jesus let his heart be known to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So don't tell me that we can't let God see who we truly are. He can handle it. He can handle the real us. He made the real us. He can handle it. Now notice verse 14. They lifted up their voices, wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Okay, here, is, here are the two extremes. Orpah kissed her, Ruth clung to her. Kissing in the ancient Hebrew culture was a way of saying goodbye. Okay, and so we do the same thing, right? You know, give me a kiss goodbye in the morning, and maybe even with family, you, you kiss before you leave or whatever. That's whatever. That's fine. The same way with them. So this is a sign that Orpah is going to return. And in verse 15, we're going to see that she has. But notice that it says Ruth clung to her. The word for clung here is the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Now, you know Genesis 2, 24, right? A man shall leave his father and mother and do what? You know the verse. Cleave to his wife. Okay? The word cleave there means to pursue with all energy. It has the idea, because remember, Hebrews like to use words as word pictures. Okay? And so the word cleave has this idea of hanging from a tree. Well, if you're hanging from a tree, you're going to pursue that with all your energy for fear of falling, right? So what's Ruth doing? She's not given a nice little side hug. She is clinging. She is pursuing with all energy. In other words, it's going to take a mighty big crowbar to pry her off of Naomi. Now, this is one verse that I, I really try to ask when I'm doing premarital counseling with somebody, I try to ask them about. Do you have a relationship with your in-laws where if the worst of the worst happened, you could cling to them? I mean, pursue with all energy. Now, some of us are blessed enough where we can say that. Others of us aren't. And I try to tell people in premarital counseling that in-laws are 90% of the battle. And I like to have both the guy and the girl read the book of Ruth. Not to talk about Boaz and Ruth and their romance and all that. Oh, how sweet. No, because I can tell you right now, and all of y'all can too, y'all been married longer than I have. Oh, how sweet lasts for just a little bit. And then the real world hits. Well, Ruth and Boaz is a oh, how sweet story. Naomi and Ruth is a real story. So, you've got the clinging here. I think that's really important. Now, verse 15 is going to lead us into our theme verse. She said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Y'all, that bothers me. I'm just going to tell you straight up, it bothers me. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do, don't, do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and uh, there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more, so, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Okay. Notice that she says, look, don't you see what your, what your sister-in-law is doing here? She's gone back. She's been the good one. Okay. She's done what I say. Now, as a daughter-in-law, and you've left your family, and you're there with your uh, father and mother-in-law, that, that is to whom you are submissive now. And so Ruth, by clinging to Naomi, is blatantly disrespecting and disregarding the command of Naomi as her mother-in-law. Naomi says, look, don't you see what the good one did? She's gone back. 
Okay, now I told you when we were reading this, this bothers me because Naomi is letting her go back to her people and to her gods. And so I don't know what level of devotion to to Yahweh that uh, Naomi may have had or, or whatever. And I think here it's not so much that she's allowing Orpah to go back to these pagan gods, but she's letting her go have her own life. She's letting her get on with it. Now, verse 16, of course, most famous verse out of all of Ruth. And it's our theme verse. And I said when we got here, we would talk about it uh, in, in two ways. Number one, it is a beautiful verse, but put yourself in Ruth's shoes. What is Ruth really saying? Where you go, I will go. Well, where is she going? She's going back to Bethlehem. But she's going with absolutely nothing. A lot of times we read this verse and we say, oh, that's so sweet. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And we're going to be two peas in a pod. Ruth is not expecting to go back to the mansion on the hill. She's not expecting to go back to a Ferrari in the driveway. She's expecting to go back to poverty because that's what Naomi has. Now, they may have left rich, but all the men have died. Orpah's gone back. It is two women sticking together. They got nothing. Now, when we do this in premarital counseling, I ask the couple, would you be willing to go with your in-laws if they had nothing to offer? They had nothing in the bank account, no house, not a thing in the world. An earthquake comes and your significant other dies and they're left by themselves Would you go live with them knowing you had nothing? Now, we talked about earlier about how this verse is often read at weddings. I I do get a lot of people say, hey, can you read this verse at our wedding whenever we start? Because, you know, that's that's the verse that we want to say to each other. Okay, uh, and by the way, I don't. Because I'm a firm believer in not taking verses out of context. And this is not a verse between a husband and wife. This is a verse between a daughter-in-law and mother-in-law. So where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Now that says something, because they're going to be homeless. Now, children in the ancient world are the original health care system. They're the original insurance policy. They're the original retirement fund. You as a child were supposed to take care of your parents when they got older. There was no such thing as nursing homes back then, okay? So you were responsible for taking care of your parents. Well, guess what? Naomi has no one. And so what is Ruth saying? She's not only saying, I'm expecting to go back to a life of poverty, but she's saying, I'm going to take care of you because you have no one. Now Orpah packed up and went back. At the request of Naomi. I cannot fault Orpah for that. But Ruth says, I will take care of you. And notice what she says here also about uh, verse 17. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. In other words, I'm going to make sure that you have a proper funeral. I'm going to make sure that they don't just throw you in a hole in the ground. I'm going to see everything out all the way to the end. And and where she says, uh, your God, my God. In Hebrew, it's the word Elohim. Elohim can be singular or plural. It has a plural ending, but most of the time when it's talking about God, it is a singular, uh, kind of an all-encompassing term. And so it's unclear whether Ruth is really saying, your your God, the God, will be my God, or whether she's saying, I'm just going to fall into your religious code because that's what uh, I should do if I'm following you. I think ultimately she's going to find that God is God. But right here, I'm not entirely sure. Let's end it here. Uh, with a few more verses. The two of them went, went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. The women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. The Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? So Naomi's changed her name. She's not Naomi anymore. She's Mara. Mara means bitter. Remember earlier in verse, what was it, 13? That the Lord has dealt exceedingly bitter, bitterly with her. Uh, now, 
notice that it says that the city was stirred, right? The whole town was stirred because of them. Well, why? Uh, well, maybe it's because they were wealthy when they left and they came back in poverty. Notice that Naomi says that when they left, uh, they left full and was brought back empty. Now, I think that's talking about her familial relationship, not necessarily possessions. It may have been because she was in the presence of a Moabite woman. It may have just been the fact that there's two single women coming into town. I don't know, but somehow the, the whole place was in an uproar. Last verse here, Naomi, uh, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, the barley harvest is at the end of April or the first of May, and so that's about the time of the year that they came back. This barley harvest is going to be significant because when they come back, uh, Ruth is going to need to glean in the fields, right? She's going to need to go out and gather where she's going to meet Boaz. Uh, also a good reason why this is read with the Migalot at Pentecost, because Pentecost is a celebration of the harvest. Okay? And so uh, think about the day of Pentecost. What was going on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem? This book was being read at a celebration of the harvest.